how could we be sure of the genuine presence of a user? And that was the problem that we set out to solve, which nobody else was worrying about at that time. So yeah, we are on our way to the office of iPro. They are quite unique in what they do, but I'll not spoil, I'll let them tell what the business is about. Uh, and I'll see you inside their office. us to your office. We're very happy to be here. Let's start by talking about your role in the business and I'm quite curious about the story of inception of uh, iProof if you would like to talk about that. I'm Andrew Budd. I'm the founder uh, and CEO of iProof. So the key issue is how can we be sure that a person is whom they claim to be? I was very excited by face verification whose technology moment was coming. It's great. From a usability point of view, it's wonderful. I look at my device, it looks back at me. Nothing could be simpler. The, the sensor for face verification is built into pretty much every personal device. Every mobile phone, every tablet, every laptop has a front-facing camera. So it's simple, passive, ubiquitous, and thanks to advances, modern advances in face verification, it works really, really well. It was clear to me that the key risk was that people would produce uh, forgeries of faces. Not that they would try to fool the face recognizer, but that they would present uh, bog pho photographs or stolen recordings of faces. So the real question was, how could we be sure of the genuine presence of a user? And that was the problem that we set out to solve, which nobody else was worrying about at that time. The way we do it is that we use the screen of the user's device to illuminate their face with a rapid sequence of changing colors. While that happens, we stream the video back to our servers where we analyze how the reflections of that screen illumination from the user's face are interacting. That's, with that that's face. just genius. Because obviously, uh, the real human face would reflect back light differently than a computer screen or a piece of paper would. Correct. So, on the one hand, how it reflects off the planes and shapes and tints of the, of the face tells us whether we're looking at a real three dimensional skin covered human face shaped object or not. But the sequence of colors that we flash is different each time. I see. So it's like, a, it's like an encrypted time Encryption. Stamp. So if somebody captures a recording of you eye proving and plays it back, we'll spot it immediately because the, the colors will be reflecting right, but the sequence of colors will be wrong. I mean, that's, that's incredible. But as, young, as every entrepreneur knows, getting from POC proof of concept to actual product that has customers, it's not an easy journey. And it can be a very resource intensive journey in terms of funding as well. So what, what uh, has that been in your case? Uh, did you receive any funding? If so, at what stages? And how, how, how has that made it possible to come today? We've been very fortunate because we received a lot of money from the UK's innovation agency, Innovate UK. Uh, they, uh, they run uh, competitive uh, bidding processes um, with a relatively low success rate. Many companies are happy to win one or two of such grants in their lifetime. We have won now 18. And this was fantastic for us because uh, it meant that we were able to put our heads down and keep our mouths shut while we did the really hard, deep tech development that was necessary to make iProof actually work and work reliably without the pressure of having to rush with a half-baked MVP out into the market prematurely, which is the terrible destiny that, that, that yes. so many uh, technology firms are forced to um, by uh, impatient seed funding. We were tremendously supported by Innovate UK, who specifically wanted us to work on the technology development. So that got us through some of the most dangerous and riskiest parts of the R&D cycle. And then starting in 2015, we were supported by uh, investment under the EIS scheme, the Enterprise, uh, the enterprise um, Investment Scheme, uh, by a number of um, private investors, notably the partners of, a, uh, of a, a London private equity firm called JRJ. So a lot of uh, businesses do either succeed or fail because of their different strategies in uh, recruitment decisions and in building a company culture. So uh, how would you define, how, what is the growth story of iProof in terms of the people and the culture here? We were insanely lucky. Okay. Okay. Um, we were extraordinarily lucky. The, 
I had worked with a number of outstandingly talented people in my in the previous my previous company. There were a number of key executives there who um, I had worked with very closely, whose strengths and weaknesses I knew, and were outstandingly I knew to be outstandingly capable individuals. And when we started, when IPU started operating in 2013, um, by good fortune, um, had become available. So I was working with very talented individuals there. The second was that I had been for 15 years the uh, chairman of the External Advisory Council on Computer Science at University College London. And through that I had built relationships with uh, the computer science department there. Yeah. And through that network I was able to, get, I was able to meet some, a, couple, a couple of outstanding individuals who had both the intellect and the temperament to um, work as part of a, a team so we were just extraordinarily lucky to find people who were both extremely brilliant, extremely motivated, extremely dedicated, and uh, excited by having to deal with hard problems in a lean environment as a team. With that in mind, um, if I was a, a person sitting in front of his computer and listening to this, and maybe possibly thinking about joining this company in the future, what are, things, what are some things that I should know about the business and the people here? The thing that people here like doing, they like solving hard problems and they like doing it in teams. Um, it's very interesting, we've recently been doing some culture work to try to identify the things that make this um, a place where people do love, people love to work and people do love to work here. They really commit tremendously. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs who expects or demands that people work nights and weekends. I think that's fundamentally wrong to, to, to demand and to bully. But people work insanely long hours because they, they want to. And what, what is it about the culture that they like it here? It's the intellectual challenge of, of successfully addressing hard problems. We recruit bright people here because it means that they can interact smoothly, fluidly and move forward quickly. Probably the boredom threshold here is quite low, but you don't have time to get bored because there's so much to do. Um, but also at the same time, it's it's a it's a very supportive culture. So I'm Tanya, and I work as a sales development representative, and so it's really my job to you know research into the market and just find out what we have potential to sort of sell our products into. Um, obviously, the flash map technology. Um, yeah, so in the basic term, that's, that's what I do. Uh, I'm Gemma, I, I'm a research scientist, so my job is uh, I do computer vision, so I design um, new systems and improve the current systems uh, to do the face matching and the anti spoofing part of our system. Um, I think it's just very nice to be part of a dynamic company. I think, you know, you have the coders over here, you've got the sales people over there, uh, you've got the researchers as well. So, yeah, I think it's a new challenge for me. and. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's quite a fun environment as well and everyone is really just supportive, helping each other out. So yeah, it's quite exciting. Uh, we've definitely got much uh, more of a sales presence now. Originally there was this one person um, trying to sell it and everyone else trying to build. Uh, so it's much more, it's more interesting now we've got a product really stable and now we're ready to, for it to go to market and then sell it in a big way which is really cool. Uh, so we've had loads of people join us recently which has been really awesome. Um, when I joined there were only 14 people and now we're over 40 so it's, it's been quite fun seeing the company expand over the last few years. Uh, so it's a really cool product which is really uh, always fun to work on a really interesting product. Everyone in the company is really motivated, it's kind of a common goal which is something really unique to, to this kind of smaller um, style of company where we, we're all working on the same product together, we all help each other out. Um, so it's like a really uh, collaborative um, and supportive environment which is really cool. Yeah, I think I'll just be echoing everything she just said as well. I think it's just for me, it's just fun to be, you know, knowing that I'm not really into the code inside of things or the research inside of things, but I still feel very much involved in how we're sort of pushing the products out there in the market. And so it's very exciting to just be a part of that, knowing that we're all intertwined in one way or another in this product that we're trying to generate um, more sort of, I guess, attention to as well. And yeah, it's really, it's a really supportive environment to be in. It's a very much um, exciting environment to be in, knowing that we have this unique product that we are selling and um, just watching it grow and how we develop is a very exciting, exciting times. So why are you based in London? There are a number of reasons, actually. One is that I live in London, and all the other SLTs are, uh, SLT people, sorry, senior leadership team members, 
are within easy, are scattered all around, but we're all within easy commuting distance of London. In fact, we're in Waterloo because Waterloo is the epicenter of, of everybody's commute. This is the easiest place for everybody who works in the company to get to. But there are lots of other reasons. I mean, there are more technical experts in our specific fields here. There are more people who know about the specific sectors and the specific problems in London than there are in some countries. Yeah. We can get access here to skills, capabilities, resources that, are, uh, that, w that would be unimaginable anywhere else. We're, we're 20 minutes underground ride from most of our biggest UK customers. It's, it's an exciting, infinitely deep pool with, with all the power of a, of a global cluster. I was born in this city. I lived overseas for 10 years. Um, I'm still excited to be back here. Uh, we've touched j just a bit on, on, on building complexity and, and bringing in different points. Uh, at this day and age, especially for startups and scale-ups, it's, it's more and more like uh, using different components and, and combining them in the, in the right way in people, in customers. But I think a huge, and always I always say this, an under-discussed and underappreciated part of that is the uh, SaaS solutions businesses actually depend on themselves, even if they're a SaaS business, uh, the tools, essentially, the, what's in the toolbox for the new businesses. So do you depend on any of, of, of those tools? If, if so, what are your favorites? So it's really fascinating. This is my third, this is my third technology startup. Um, my second, I founded back in 2000, and I had to build the infrastructure of the business using the tools that were available uh, 18 years ago, and doing it now is a is an unbelievably luxurious. And your experience. experience with that is actually very valuable because it's it, it's a very good contrast to to, to see that. It, so what are your unbelievable? I mean, an accounting system, building a multi current, how you, uh, getting a multi currency accounting system that gave meaningful reports and we could structure and control was a nightmare 15 years ago. Now we use zero. And as long as zero is continuously developing, and as long as zero stays a week ahead of our requirements, I'm very happy. But it's, it's, it's great. Telephone systems. We used to have to buy, go out and buy PABXs, which were never the right shape. Now we just set up with Vonage or with Ring Central or with Zoom, and we've got a, communication, we've got a communications system just like that. Fantastic. Um, we, have a, we have the luxury of choice of a CRM system. In 2003, we had to put in um, a software-based CRM system. I can show you the scars. Now there's just an, a, a tremendous richness of choice, um, ranging obviously from the cost and complexity and power of Salesforce all the way down to... In just two or three years, it's incredible change. CRM used to be a problem. It's gone away. Uh, there's a whole suite of sales automation tools which are fantastic and never never existed before. Um, our system, a system administration and monitoring. I remember when we had to put in place a system alarming. We had to grovel around in the world of of of, um, of open source to find something. Now, now we can choose and we can change. The mere fact of reporting, the fact that Google Sheets, for goodness sakes, um, enables you to to publish and distribute information. A numerical information to, to companies is fantastic. We're mass, big, great users of, uh, of, of the full Google ac application suite, which is, which is terrific. So we use loads of these systems, and it's just such a luxury not to have to worry too much about them. We need an alerting system, pager duty. You know? we, need a, we, need a, uh, we need a logging system got one. It's, it makes life so easy now that you would just have to say which rather than how. Uh, so with that, what are your some future milestones and, and considering all that we've discussed, is there anything you'd like to add? So I confess we, we have a dream which was uh, best summed up uh, a few years ago when a, a former uh, advisor to the British government um, uh, on biometrics came to see us um, he was very skeptical. How could a small, a small band of people he'd never heard of in really, really shabby offices, that the, the roof was leaking, um, the doors didn't close properly, how could we pr imagine that we were going to uh, change the world of, of, of identity and of biometrics when there were such billion-dollar companies out there? At the end of many hours with us of due diligence, 
As he left, he said, my concern for you guys is whether you will be ready to meet the operational challenges you will face when you become the default way people authenticate on the internet. So that is our, uh, frankly, that is our ambition. Um, when our CTO joined us, he said, what do you want me to do, Andrew? Actually, I said, I want you to build an architecture that will scale to a billion users. So our milestones are measured in millions and millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people who've I proved. We're heading, we will, I think, soon, we will quite soon get to the point where 10 million or more people have I proved. Then our next milestone will be 100 million people and then our next milestone will be a billion people. We want to be able to help people all over the world establish trust in them, in the online economy, so that they can do, see, buy, transact more. And we want people aged nine to 90 to be able to do it, whatever their ability, whatever their technical skill, we want to make it easy and safe for them to engage with the online economy, protecting those organizations who supply those services against a rising and increasing tide of, of, of cyber threat. Thank you very much for taking the time. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Very inspiring uh, to hear all those. Thank you for that, Andrew. Thank you very much. Andrew.